is to use a sorry is to use a um, uh, a randomized control trial in Bangladesh to distinguish between these two views. So let's begin with just the the first sort of fact, which is that that it's not the case that the poor are poor because they don't work. Most of the poor work. Uh, the problem is that the uh, returns to that work are very low. Um, so in general, the poor lack assets, both human capital, physical capital. And for most people, it's just the return on the hourly work that determines their, their income. So our sort of central focus is on on, on occupations and work and how that affects uh, poverty. So as I already said, labor is, this, is often the sole endowment of the poor and the link between jobs and poverty is key. And that's true in Bangladesh, it's true in South Africa, it's true in the UK. And interestingly, um, when you look at work, a lot of people are working in very low productivity uh, jobs with very low earnings, and that's the, that's the reason they're poor. If we look specifically at the context of South Asia, a lot of that work is uh, casual work, so day, day contracts as laborers, either uh, working uh, for, for somebody with land as an agricultural laborer or working as domestic, uh, as domestic servants. So it's not just... Uh, it's casual, but it's also highly itinerant. It, it, the demand uh, can, can go up and down an enormous amount within a year. So the central question that we want to ask is, do people stay poor because they are only able to do bad jobs or do they do bad jobs because they are poor? And that is sort of the, the, the central thing we want to look at. And I, I, I hope that I can get to the end because one of the big things that comes out of answering this question is a, is a very uh, different perspective on social protection policy and how one, how one organizes that. I don't think I'll go through the literature, but uh, on poverty traps, poverty trap literature is both in the macro sphere, you know, why some countries remain poor. Uh, some of it is in the uh, micro sphere, but it's been very difficult uh, to, um, establish evidence of a poverty trap. So we think through this RCT, we've been able to provide some of the most credible uh, uh, evidence for the existence of a poverty trap. So going back to the sort of two views of poverty, the, the, the sort of uh, second view, which is that people are poor because they lack opportunity, is what we would describe as a poverty trap view. That there's, there's people trapped in poverty, not because they are unable to do uh, more productive work, but simply they lack the opportunity uh, to do that. For example, they may not have the physical capital, they may not have the human capital to do that. So they're not making full use of their, of their abilities. So if we, um, if we look at people or, or countries, then the kind, of, uh, the, the kind of equal opportunity, the idea that people are poor because they're unproductive is this one here, that there's some people who are more productive, and so you get people who are either in the low state or the high state simply because they have different uh, productivities. But the poverty trap view is very different because it says that um, people are not poor because of the, uh, because they have inherently different productivities. They're inherently poor because they have uh, different access to opportunities. So in this case, if you fall below K hat in the, in the diagram, then you fall back into the low state, whereas if you rise above uh, K hat, you rise up to the uh, to the high state. So these are these are transition equations, which is usually how you look at poverty trap. So we're going to try to identify the data, which of these two uh, uh, states of the world uh, uh, pertain. Okay, so. I do want to emphasize the policy importance of this because it's something we've been talking to the World Bank and the IMF, as well as BRAC and the Bangladesh government about, which is um, then in the first world, the kind of equal opportunity world, then if people um, have the same productivity, they'll, they'll, they'll converge to that productivity. So uh, they'll climb, if they're more productive, 
and what makes them poor, they'll climb out of poverty, even with small uh, nudges. So in that world, anti-poverty policies support consumption because if you're uh, unproductive, so you, you would remain poor without, uh, without assistance, then the only thing you can do is to drip feed in consumption transfers to keep your income above whatever society deems as the, the poverty line. But in the second world, it's really interesting because in that world, wealth at birth determines the steady state. So you can be highly able, highly productive, but remain poor. Um, and in this world, interestingly, there's no way out uh, without a big push. So if we go back to this diagram, if I was just to give you a small transfer here, you just fall back. You need to have a big enough transfer to get you over this threshold. Okay, and we'll be very concrete about what getting you over that threshold means in the context of, of rural Bangladesh. Um, so in this unequal Robin, opportunity, yeah. That, that reminds me uh, from, of the big push uh, models. Um, any, any relation with big push story there? Yes, very much relation because Again, with big push, you need to, you know, you can't just do a small push to get you out of that equilibrium. So there's a, there's a, there's a close relationship. In fact, we call it a uh, big push, but it's big push in the sense of what's critical here, the lens you want to apply is it's what you need to allow people to do more productive jobs. So it's a kind of occupational lens. Uh, and in this particular context, it's moving you from being the laboring itinerant jobs, which the majority of women who are poor do, into the jobs where you've raised livestock, uh, in which case you need a cow or other forms of uh, capital. So it's very much how do you shift people from doing the jobs of the poor women in the villages to doing the, the, the work of the middle class and the richer women in the villages. And in a more general sense, we're by no means saying that the solution to global poverty is to give everybody a cow but what is more general is that you need um, some sort of, as you were saying, a kind of a, a big push, in this case, in productive assets to get you out of the poverty trap. A small push will not work. And it could be, by the way, that say, if we're talking about somebody moving to an urban place, that big push may be human capital. In fact, we've done quite a lot of work in Uganda with BRAC on vocational training and showed there that, you know, quite a large transfer of, uh, uh, money in terms of giving people the opportunity to do six months of uh, vocational training had a big effect on on their on their labor market outcome. So that would be a similar sort of flavor, but focusing on on human capital rather than uh, productive assets. Okay, so to give you all the kind of context, um, we have been working with BRAC, as I said, since 2006, 2007, we did the baseline and uh, uh, the um, uh, the transfer of productive assets. And what's very important, and we have a QJE paper which um, looks at the evaluation of that, of that program. What's different about the paper today is we've now trying to use it to identify between these two sort of views of, of poverty. And we've done more rounds of data, so we're now able to look at 11 years out what happened uh, to people who ended up on either side of that of that threshold. So there's kind of two bits in the paper. One is, do we see transition dynamics which are consistent with a poverty trap view of the world? And the second thing is, well, what happens uh, over the longer term? So it might be that you're pushed out of poverty, but then you fall back. And so we're able to use these rounds of data over a longer period to look at that. We also estimate a structural model of occupational choice basically to work out how big is the misallocation. So if there's women out there who are perfectly capable of doing livestock, but are unable to do so because they've never had the uh, capital to buy a cow, then we can estimate uh, in terms of their, their, their optimal occupation, what fraction of those women would have been better off had they had the capital, for example, of the richer women in these, in these villages, okay? Which is what the transfer does, it gives them uh, productive assets. Okay, so I think um, the, the setting is Bangladesh. Um, 
we've got a very large uh, sample. Um, these districts of Bangladesh were chosen because they are the most food insecure uh, districts, and you can see the that we have randomization at the at the BRAC branch, and we're really focusing at more not there, there's other places, but it's more in the northwest of the country because that's the most uh, the poorest area. It's often known as the famine region of, of Bangladesh, and. What is important, as I already said, is we have this very long relationship with BRAC, which I'm sure many of you have come across BRAC, which is one of the biggest, uh, I think it is the biggest NGO in the world by employment. And we do this uh, long running RCT. Now what's very important is that the actual program, which is essentially a combination of getting, being given a choice of productive assets to kind of start a business, and about 93% of women choose cows because that's what the ritual women of the villages are doing. And so they get a combination of this cow and also training uh, and household visits, but only for 24 months. So you, you see here that 2007 is when the baseline is and the experiment begins. So everything is finished by 2011. BRAC has moved out of the, uh, out of the treatment villages and then they begin to treat the, uh, the control villages. So what you've got is a perfect experiment until 2011. And then after that, what we're gonna be doing is comparing people where the transfer either pushed them just above or just below that, um, that threshold. But the first thing we need to identify is if we can see any uh, transition dynamics which are consistent with there being a poverty trap. So one, one thing which is important, and I think um, uh, I'm sure that the employment situation is different in, in rural South Africa, is that in, in terms of, if we just look at the control households, we don't see much mobility in terms of the poor moving up uh, into the middle and upper classes. So the poor stay poor without, without intervention. What is very striking uh, is that there is this kind of very close relationship between poverty and uh, occupation. So uh, I can sort of show it most easily on a, uh, so these are ours um, and we're just looking at a uh, baseline. And you can see here that for the, for the poor, so this is productive assets, so, so people with no productive assets to people with lots of productive assets. The majority of the, uh, uh, the poor are basically engaged in casual agriculture, which is the green and being maids, which is the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the pink, sort of uh, pinkish color. And you see that above and beyond that, there's a few other things like beggar, tailor, Whereas if you go to this side of the distribution, then almost all, these are in hours, shares of hours. The women are almost predominantly engaged in livestock. They're, they're doing, spending most of the time. So really there's only, there's only um, sort of four occupations, two agricultural servant maid, which are done by the assetless and require no physical or human capital. And then there's the uh, livestock and land cultivation, which is done by the by the richer uh, households. If you look at the difference in these classes uh, between the, the, um, uh, the rich and the poor, uh, then you see that the, though there's, you know, there are some big differences in consumption, the really big thing is in productive assets. And the bulk of that, the 94 tons, the rich have 94 tons of productive assets of the poor, the bulk of that is land and livestock. For the rich, it's, it's, it's mainly land. So I guess that would be another factor which would be relevant in, uh, in Africa as well as... Um, so we see this very strong correlation between poverty and uh, occupation. And then what's also pretty clear is that the better jobs require productive assets. So if you want to do livestock, you need to be able to afford a cow. Uh, and these, these assets such as land and cows are not only much more expensive, but they're often, as you can see here, uh, as you get more assets and more, the more expensive assets are more indivisible, okay? And this is showing that um, there's not much change in uh, uh, productive assets in the, in, in, the, in the control villages. Okay, so let me, let me now begin with a sort of, 
Let's start with the baseline. So interestingly, when we looked at productive assets, so productive assets comprise livestock, predominantly cows, but also things like goats, chickens, and so on, uh, land, and then all that sort of stuff like agricultural uh, uh, machinery, sheds, uh, rickshaws for transporting uh, fodder and so forth. Uh, so we're putting all these together, and we, this is before the experiment. And you see this interesting fact that you see this kind of bimodal distribution. And we've looked now at a whole number of countries in South Asia and find again in DHS services similar. Bi so you'll basically have a bunch of people, the sort of first peak, who have nothing, no productive assets. And then you have another set of people who have lots of uh, productive assets. And then there's this sort of area of low density here. So that suggests that there's sort of something pushing people away from this, uh, this area. And what we can do, which is fascinating, is that, as I said, the, the, the nature of the RCT is that if you're selected, so just to be a, a little bit more exact here, in terms of the, um, if you're in the ultra poor, so the way the selection goes is that the, there's some initial census of everybody in all the villages, and then the community comes together and they all have a business card to identify as a household. And then they decide to sort people into these different bins. Well, the top bin would be people with land, productive assets, education, whereas at the bottom would be no productive assets, no assistance from government, no assistance from government, often the children out of school. Uh, so very much the kind of very poorest uh, group. And that's decided by the community. And then within the ultra poor, we randomize uh, which villages get the choice of this, um, uh, these businesses, and most people choose to get uh, a cow. And the size of the transfer is very sizable. It's, it's, it's above, it's just around the annual per capita expenditure of a household. So it's, it's something which typically they could not afford, for example, to borrow from microfinance organizations. It's too big an amount, the, the, the cost of the cow and the training. In terms of the test, so it's about, the value of the assets is about one year PC, so about five times a typical microloan. So um, the point that was made about the beginning, that the kind of capital constraints are paramount here. So it's a combination of capital credit constraints, plus it will come to the need to have complementary assets to grow, to run a livestock business, such as a shed, a rickshaw to transport uh, fodder and so forth. Because the the technology is very much you have the cow on your on your land, you feed it, you get milk, you get meat. It's not it's not extensive uh, uh, dairy. It's basically uh, household uh, uh, livestock production. And the poor have very few cows. The rich may have uh, uh, sort of ten to thirty cows. Okay. So the, the nature of the test, and this is the critical thing. And by the way, this was in some ways luck that, um, or, or good design on the part of BRAC. What we're basically doing is we're taking um, the uh, group of people, so the ultra poor, this is where they're, you know, this is the range of the assets at the beginning. So this is without any intervention. And we're moving them here by giving them this large transfer. So it's basically like we're putting people into this area of low density. And what is critical is then we can see what happens depending on their initial level of uh, assets, which we call uh, K0. So some of them will have absolutely nothing. Some will have a shed, some will have a rickshaw. And those things, if they have them, will be complementary to having the cow and hence uh, make it more likely that their, their business will, will operate successfully. So, what we're doing is basically this. So now you can see the, the, the distribution of productive assets in the treatment villages. It's basically to, to push a bunch of people into this area. And then the whole point of the transition equation, which you look at between 2009 when the program starts and 2011 when it finishes, is to see what does that transition dynamics look like? That's sort of the central sort of test of the poverty trap part of the paper. Now, one thing that's interesting is if you look at control villages, uh, and these are households and control villages, you never see shops of this magnitude. So the shops that are induced by BRAC, by the program, are much, much larger. So only 6% of households and control villages experience um, shops of this magnitude. So that's 
uh, suggesting what's happening is something rather extra extraordinary to these people's these people's lives. And okay. and Robin and Robin, this this shock is it uh, essentially access to finance uh, as in the no, it's, it's as in the binary? Go ahead. It's basically you actually get a cow. You have a you have a selection of businesses, and if you so you could be like growing vegetables for sale. It could be uh, goats and it could be cows. And then once you've selected what you want, you get some classroom training to, to show you how to run this business. And then critically for 24 months afterwards, you get weekly visits where they go through your finances, they say, have there any problems with running the business? So they kind of help you to get going. And then at 24 months, they stop. So the long run effects are interesting because after that 24 months, there's no more assistance from Brad. But it is, Brack, in the case of a cow, will procure a cow from a local market uh, and transfer it to you. So it's a physical transfer, an actual asset rather than the money. We're actually doing an RCT in Pakistan at the moment where we compare a cash transfer to uh, this, this, this design. But this was the design that, that Brack uh, came up with. And interestingly, you know, the, the name graduation program was, is often now, an, it's actually often interpreted now as graduation out of poverty, but interestingly, it came up as graduation into microfinance. So it is, what, what Brack felt is that these are people who are so poor, for example, if you're an ag laborer, they didn't have any demand for capital. And this is a way of kind of generating that demand. But now since it's done so well, even relative to microfinance, people think of it as graduation out of poverty, but the original name was graduation into microfinance, which is interesting. Okay. So let's now look at the, um, so the central problem with looking for poverty traps in observational data, whether that's country or individual, is that this, this area here is unstable, right? So people who come here may be pushed out. So you need, the value of the RCT here is that you're pushing people into this area and you're seeing whether they rise or fall or whether they all rise or all fall. So we're going to look at the uh, and what are we going to do to kind of what what variation we're going to use to identify it is how much productive assets do they have before the program? So their K zero. So the K zero is going to include the transfer, but it's going to place people at different points along the K line because some people would have a shed, some people would have a ritual, but some people have nothing. Um, and then also we can test uh, eleven years out. Okay, so this is sort of what the theory would tell us. So that the kind of equal opportunity, everything comes down to how productive people are, view would be like, there would be a steady state, depending on where you started, even a small thing would allow, and then you would accumulate up to this point, right? So you would have another person who is less productive, they'd cross at a, at a lower line. And, and so if they, if they cross, for example, down here, they would be deemed as poor, these people would be, would be deemed as rich. This is very different because here you have an unstable steady state, right? So the idea here, this, this uh, crossing is stable, this crossing is stable, but this is unstable. So if there's a poverty trap, then you would expect to see an S-shaped uh, transition equation because if you were just slightly below that crossing, you would fall back if you were slightly above. And the thing that is, which has always attracted people to poverty traps is that seems incredibly unfair, right? That means that people with identical abilities, one of them can become rich and the other uh, falls back into poverty. Because for example, by the accident of their birth, somebody was born with some capital, somebody was born without capital. But it has been very, very difficult to, to, to find evidence of poverty traps. So what do we find? So this is the data, so this is 2000, uh, seven, this is 2011. So we're just using the period when we're doing the RCT. There's no treatment of the control households. And you see very much uh, what you'd expect with the poverty trap, which is that if you, if, if with the, so this is including the transfer, let's say you started at zero and it only brought yourself, say, to here, then you fall back. You, you don't uh, successfully operate the cow business and you fall back. However, if you rise above that point, then you rise above and you converge as you would do here to a much, much higher uh, steady state. So in other words, a group of people are falling into poverty 
a group of rising out and they all receive essentially the same value of transfer. So this is very consistent uh, with the poverty trap view. This is just a, a method for identifying the exact um, the crossing points. It's crossing these are log scales at 2.34. And you can do it to polynomial, uh, get very similar, uh, very similar results. So the key thing here is the transition dynamics. And this is the thing that I guess is attracting a lot of attention now is that this seems like fairly uh, convincing evidence that the, uh, the poverty trap view of the world at least holds in these, in these Bangladeshi villages. What's also interesting is that crossing point is very much at the trough of the bimodal distribution of, of assets. So as I said before, we've, I'll show you at the end, but we've gone and in the last uh, month or so pulled together like huge numbers of DHS data sets uh, from around South Asia. And we're really finding this bimodal distribution as being a uh, fairly commonplace. In other words, if the group of people in, the, in, in rural parts of say Afghanistan or Pakistan or India who have land and other assets, and then there's a group of people often working for them who have nothing. And, and that is, um, uh, it, that you'd have to believe that in the first year of poverty that those people with the no assets are just unproductive low ability people if you're gonna take the first equal opportunity view. Whereas the unequal opportunity view says, no, the distribution of ability is probably fairly unrelated to the distribution of productive assets. It's just that, uh, for example, through inheritance that you fall into the zero assets part of, uh, upon birth uh, and hence are constrained to doing very unproductive jobs. You would need to have something else, a big push, as Manuel was putting it, to get you into the more uh, productive job. So this is a fairly major finding and the, the main sort of threat, I guess, to, to identification is simply that of course, the transfer is randomized, but it's, an, it's of, a, of an equal value but what we're using to identify the transition equation is the variation in, in uh, K0, right? So, which is not randomized. I mean, the, the, the communities chose who the ultra poor were and it just happened that some of them would have a rickshaw, some of them would have uh, some uh, shed or something like that, which would then be complementary with, with cow production. So what we can do is we can do a bunch of things where we look at, um, uh, do people, so this is just showing you basically in the regression that, that the, the, the K, that crossing point is unstable. So if, you, if you're uh, below it, then you fall back into poverty. If you're above it, you rise out of poverty. So that's, you know, that's showing that it's statistically highly significant. And the problem, as I've already said, is that it, the identification is based on differences in initial assets, which are very, very small because it people are roughly assetless, but there's still some variation there, which turns out to be important, but they're not randomized. Okay. So we can do, and I, I'll probably not go through every one of the, the checks that the paper is now revised and resubmitted at the QJE, um, and we're going through all that stuff at the moment. But just to give you a kind of a flavor of what we, we've done to sort of check on this. The first is we have control villages. So control villages, just as the treatment villages are experiencing shocks, there's weather shocks, there's health shocks. Uh, and we can use, um, because the placement is randomized, we can use the controls to account for shocks. So we can see, uh, uh, we can control for the shocks that are experienced by the uh, control households and, and we still find the same um, effects. We can also look at the transition equation in control villages, and there we find only a single crossing because uh, basically you're only looking at this point here in the, uh, in, the, um, in the distribution of productive assets. So you can see the problem is if you only had observational data, it would be very, very difficult to find evidence of uh, poverty traps because you, you the, the, the shocks never, as I said before, it never sort of push you into this unstable area, right? So there's, there's few households there because you either end up with nothing or you end up accumulating uh, productive assets. And then you can sort of do, um, you, you can look at the control uh, households and then here you don't, you don't see this evidence of, 
uh, rising and falling because they've already converged their respective steady states. Okay, so one other thing which probably is already coming to people's minds is that if you believe the people are poor because they're unproductive view of the world, and of course that's going to be partly true, there's always going to be a continuum, but if that, if in the poverty trapped world, the dominant reason you stay poor or is because you don't have, uh, you lack opportunities to take you into more productive occupations. And, 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 and what's helpful in these back Bangladeshi villages is the occupational structure is incredibly simple. You've either got women, who are the, by the way, the targets of these transfers, who are doing laboring in agricultural labor or maid, or working in livestock with their husbands working in, in land cultivation. And so what we can then do is we can say, okay, We've got um, other, from our surveys, we've got other uh, measures such as human capital. Uh, we've got things like anxiety, psychological measures. And we can, because the notion of a poverty trap is an individual notion, we can control, um, we can control for these traits and still see whether we find uh, evidence of an S-shaped uh, uh, transition equation. So this is just controlling for pretty much kind of kitchen sink, every possible measure of education, anxiety, uh, human capital. And we still, even when we control for that, we still see this S shape. We also can think about um, whether other factors would affect where you cross. So for example, um, the story we're saying is that what gets you out of a poverty trap is first the transfer of this, for example, the, uh, the cow, but also these complementary assets like rickshaw, the sheds and so forth that get you, uh, that allow you to grow uh, the business. So one, one um, but there's other facts. If you think about a, 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 about a um, uh, transition equation, there's things like savings, uh, there's measures of productivity and A function. So if we look at a production function, what we're really thinking about that the, 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 the where you cross will depend on your ability to generate income, which is partly com com complementary assets, but also could be, for example, if you're better educated or your savings rate. So with your savings rate, you've got money accumulated, which you can put into the, the business. So these are just some graphs where we show that if we look at, for example, above meeting, so some villages are more productive, for example, they're closer to markets and so forth. And we see if you're in a le less productive village, then you cross um, uh, further out. So you cross at a higher uh, point in the productive assets because you, in, the, in the more productive place, you'd be accumulating assets uh, more quickly. You can look at savings. We see a similar uh, picture that if you have higher savings, you cross earlier. Um, Robin, your, yeah. do you know whether this, the more productive villages, if they also have more human capital in there? We haven't looked at that. This is the, this is anxiety. This, this is, what's astonishing here is that 93% uh, of the women are illiterate. So we're really to, in the ultra poor, in the target population. So this is using a very, so, so something like that, maybe 90% have not got any formal education, but nonetheless, it does make a slight difference. We haven't looked at the, because it may be true that if you're closer to a market, there's more reasons to accumulate. But what's astonishing, and these are, these are women whose median age is around 35, they all have kids, 93% illiterate. So they're like the least likely entrepreneurs in the world at some level. I mean, they're, they're not women who can move to the garment factories in uh, Dhaka. They're, they're very much stuck in these places. But nonetheless, what, what we're showing is that they're able to take on the jobs of the richer women once they're given uh, these big transfers. This is just, so what you can do is you can, um, you can, in these regressions, we're controlling for the initial K0 assets and just using the, uh, these different measures, earnings, potential, savings, anxiety, and showing that you still get these shifts in the, in the crossing point. So that's, 
taking away the worry that something about K0 having a shed, having a rickshaw is correlated with something that makes you more able to run a business because here you're controlling uh, for K0. Okay, so let me, in the remaining uh, minutes, I, I think I should leave some time for, for questions. Um, let me just show you what the long run looks like. So remember 2009, um, we've got, uh, you know, that's the end of the, the, the program. And here we're just comparing households that are above or below K hap. So this is within treatment because the control households start to get treated after 2011. This is productive assets. And you see that, uh, so remember there's tiny differences around the, uh, around the, the, the K hat. But nonetheless, if you're below K hat post transfer, as opposed to, which is what this, this, is, this regression is showing, if you're above K hat, then you accumulate productive assets much more uh, rapidly. And critically, which is really fascinating, in 2018, you start to see evidence of accumulation of land. So the big jump between 2014 and 2018 um, is land, that these households are not only doing livestock businesses, they're starting to diversify into buying paddy land, which is the big asset that differentiates the rich from the poor in, in, rural, in rural Bangladesh. You also see that consumption is shooting up. So uh, they're becoming, um, uh, this, so this is land itself, just parsing out land. So this is consumption. So again, people are growing. So even just being just below K hat versus just above, is having big long run consequences because remember the ones that are above K hat are the ones that continue to run cow business to expand that to use those surpluses to invest in land and other uh, assets and you see also an increase in uh, hours spent on livestock and uh, land cultivation and increase in, in, in total hours worked. I think um, for the structural estimation which I think is incredibly important. Um, the main thing uh, that we do here, which I think is interesting is because we have everybody doing essentially wage labor at baseline, or the, the vast majority, there's virtually nobody doing cows, we can see how productive they are in wage labor. And then after two years, because they're encouraged to keep the cow business for two years, we can see how productive they are in livestock. So we get a fix both on their wage labor productivity and a fix on their uh, productivity doing livestock. And so using that, we can estimate these individual level productivities and we can determine, we can estimate where they're most productive. They're most productive doing uh, wage labor, most productive doing livestock. And then we can use the capital holdings of the middle and richer women to see if they had those capital stocks, would it be more optimal to do the wage labor or to do the, um, the, the livestock rear? And so we could quantify uh, the extent of misallocation, occupation misallocation of baseline. And I think um, uh, we, just to sh sort of show you the, the main, so this is, this is what we do, we're, we're, we're saying if you had the the assets and the second pump of the productive asset distribution. So from there, we can then compute the optimal occupation and then we can compute the payoff uh, at, an at an optimal occupation. And we can then compare that to your actual occupation because you didn't have the, the asset holdings of the, of the upper classes at the baseline. We can see what your actual payoffs were and then we can, by taking one from the other, we can estimate misallocation and then sum up misallocation across all, all, all households. And what we find, which is really, really interesting, is that in, 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 if they had the asset holdings of the, of the upper mode, then about 90% would be doing livestock rearing. But in fact, and this is a baseline, around that slightly more are doing wage labor. In other words, the majority of the population, and these are, as I said, the poor, you know, very, very poor people are being misallocated. They would be better off uh, doing livestock. So it's not that they're poor because they're unable to do the livestock rearing, it's simply they didn't have access to the, uh, 
the capital and other inputs you need to uh, to do that. So the, the this is a very sort of striking set of values in terms of um, showing how big misallocation is. And the more you think about this, this is sort of what development economics is all about because you'd have to believe that, you know, people who live in poorer countries are less able than people who live in richer countries to believe that that's why they're poorer. What seems much, much more likely is that they're as able, inherently as able, but they haven't got the conditions either in terms of their endowments of human capital, physical capital and so forth, but also perhaps in the productive environment, how well infrastructure works, uh, how well the government works and so forth. So I think this is kind of a big deal in saying, okay, it's a very specific context, but the fact you have this incredibly simple occupational structure, and then you have this RCT that pushes people into that unstable area, actually allows you to test between these, between these two views. Um, we do a bunch of stuff to uh, say, well, okay, maybe uh, wage rates, you know, as countries become more developed, will increase. So we can look at doubling of wage rates. Maybe if a lot of people start, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing livestock, you have equilibrium price effects. But one thing that's interesting there is because the richer women have much bigger herds, the actual addition of cows, because the, the poor start with one cow, is not huge in terms of, so we don't see uh, a big uh, price effect. Um, so basically this result about there being a large amount of misallocation seems to be, seems to be fairly uh, robust. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of these different robustness uh, checks. And I'm gonna finish with a, a few words on policy, which I think is kind of where we're, you know, we're in discussion, as I said, with some of the big organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, who are involved in design of transfers to for poor people uh, and anti-poverty policies, as well as with a whole range of governments. Because one thing that I do is I, I'm a director of the International Growth Center that has a bunch of offices in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So one, one thing we're interested in is how this study can be used to sort of rethink uh, social protection policy. So I'll give you the sort of bare bones of what, what we're trying to say. So this is um, what you can do. Is you can estimate, because obviously if you're epsilon away from the K hat, then anything is going to jump you over, right? So that's even a small chance to jump you over. But what you see here is that BRAC is placing, this is the size of the transfer, as a ratio of annual per capita consumption. As I said it's almost uh, one annual per capita consumption, the size of, so it's a very, very sizable uh, transfer. It's a big, a big push of money I'll put in. And what you can see is you're getting about almost 70% of women um, above K hat from that transfer, right? Now, interestingly, obviously, if you shove it down here, you'd only be getting 20%. Right? Or if you shove it over here, you'd be getting 40%. So this is making the point, which is a really important point, which is that to get a bunch of people who are very poor above K hat and then on, on a path to accumulating assets. Because remember, all the long run stuff, the intervention stops after 24 months. There's no further practice, nothing further. So all that land accumulation, improvements in consumption, improvements in... Um, uh, working in uh, livestock and so forth. All that's just been driven by that big push in those two years. Now, the interesting thing is because we're doing it as a share of per capita consumption, we can then compare this to other programs because we can figure out, well, how much say is a microfinance loan relative to uh, per capita consumption. And what you see is interesting. So um, these are sort of typical microloans. And you can see that the microloans are way, way down here. So the size of the microloans, if you remember the, in, in the context we were in in Bangladesh, the size of the BRAC graduation program transfer is about five times the typical microloan. So the issue with microloans, and there's been this whole literature about uh, microcredit and whether it, it leads to any effect on the extensive margin in terms of occupation, in terms of starting businesses and finding very few effects. One of the problems is that it's just not big enough to allow you to change occupation. 
This is Enriga, which many of you will know about. It's a big transfer program in rural India. Again, it's very, very small relative to uh, uh, per capita consumption. And then these are the other uh, evaluations of the graduation program, not, not operated by BRAC, which Esther Duflo and others looked at. And the one, the one of the ones that's most effective is the Indian one, which is just across the border in, in West Bengal. And again, that's a fairly sizable size of transfer. Blackman, which is in, in Uganda, which also finds big effects, also very large. So what this is saying is that if you want to ship, it's basically kind of intensive margin versus extensive margin. If to get people out of poverty, you have to get them into better jobs, then small transfers may not work if they're in poverty traps. You may have to do big transfers, either productive assets or of human capital to get them into uh, different jobs. And very much the, the study we, we just published in Econometrica on Uganda finds that for a group of a population where a much younger population from a disadvantaged type of a part of the Ugandan um, uh, uh, consumption distribution. So people, you know, a lot of them were aid orphans and so forth. The effect of giving them free six months vocational education in terms of the jobs they get into relative to the control group is astonishing. And it suggests that it's not that these kids were unable to take on better jobs in urban areas, just they didn't have the money to, uh, to, to make those investments that would make them, you know, uh, to say become a, a welder or, 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 or one of these uh, types of jobs. So I think to finish, um, the, the kind of the, the punchline, I guess, is that it's not that poor people are unable to take on more productive employment options, they just lack the required capital misallocation results suggest that the lack of opportunity prevents about 96 percent engaging in in their optimal occupation and the existence of a poverty threshold implies that only transfer is large enough to push beneficiaries past the threshold will reduce poverty in the long run so the key policy conclusion is that to tackle persistent poverty you need big push policies that tap into the talents of the poor rather than just propping up their consumption, which, to be honest, even in the UK has been the, the dominant mm. approach to uh, social pr protection and welfare programs. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Robin. Um, let's see, uh, there, there are two questions there. Uh, okay, one is from uh, Alice de Lamini. The model you speak of is familiar to the model my late father taught, and I'm slowly picking up called Money Matters, God's... Um, answer to poverty teaching and empowering poor communities to use the resources they have in their hands to take themselves out of poverty um, feed yourself use the excess to sell it and add value to it what, what's the question I, th I think it's more like a comment right um i think it's more a, a comment yeah okay Okay, Yanni, Yanni, uh, Yanni Rousseau has a question. Yanni, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Manuel. I really want to ask a question about population size in the different households, and then more importantly, population or household size, household size growth during the period of your measurement. Did it make any difference whether uh, some of these very poor women had more children during the period that you measured or didn't have any extra children at all? So how is poverty then related to population growth in that sense? Thank you very much. Yeah, so I didn't show it, but we had, um, we did, we, what we can show is, I guess there's two things. One is that if you have more kids, the household sizes are not huge. I think the median's around four point something, but there's quite a lot of women who are um, without a husband. But the interesting thing is that if you have more kids, then you cross, it's like the opposite of the, uh, the savings things. You cross, um, that, that, that slows down your crossing of the threshold. So that's a kind of a drag on you because you've got more, more kids to feed. Interestingly, the latest thing we're doing is following the kids of the mums that got the program at different points. So, you know, some mums would get it when they, they, the kids were in utero, some when they were in primary school, 
some of their own secondary school. And what we're finding, which is fascinating, is that if the mom got the program when she was in utero or in the first sort of uh, year, then you really see some effects on, um, on the anthropometrics of the children. So there's, a, there, there's not just the effects on the moms getting out of poverty, you're starting to see this kind of intergenerational picture of the kids being better off if the mom got the program earlier. So for example, if the mom got the program early, we see effects on better primary school completion rates, secondary school completion rates, better labor market outcomes. So, but, but on your specific question, there's not dramatic population growth during the period. It's not different between the treatment and control, but certainly if you're a mom with more kids, you, it, it slows down your accumulation of assets and you cross uh, 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 further up the K, K distribution, as you do, for example, with lower savings. Um, thanks, thanks, Robin. Uh, I was also thinking, uh, because these transfers, they are going to people who are in the rural sector and yeah. they stay there. So there is, there is no, let's say, structural transformation in terms of urbanization happening there. So they stay there. Does, does it bother you somehow? I mean, I anything that, that holds people in rural areas could, could be counterproductive if we believe that they might have been better off moving to, to urban areas. So I think certainly for the kids of the women, it's gonna be interesting to see whether they, they use the, the higher human capital to move. Um, but I think for these women, I think it, it comes down to really a, a decision for the policymaker as to whether you focus on poverty now for this group, which are not going to move um, because they, they have kids, they, they, have not, they don't have the, the qualifications to work in, in many of the urban jobs. So it's a group that it's sort of like, I've worked quite a lot on, on famines in India with Dave Donaldson. It's kind of that group, you know, it's the people without human capital, without physical capital. And I think you have to make a decision. Are you going to support them and find ways to get them into better jobs? Or are you going to just hope that their kids do better and that growth sort of take care of so them? So they, they would be stuck in the rural sector in any way, let's say. I think at that age with dependents and women and all the kind of issues around women being, I mean, young women can move, unmarried women, but for, for older married women with dependents, I think it's difficult. There is, of course, you know, the much bigger issue, which we're working on also on, climate migration, you know, because Bangladesh is gonna be one of the most exposed to climate uh, change. And then that does raise quick questions about whether we shouldn't be doing things, like maybe the transfers now should be about training to get people urban jobs where possible, rather than holding them in the countryside. Cool. Uh, Lucas, uh, you have a question, go ahead, please. Yeah, very cool paper, uh, the data is amazing. Uh, your I saw your, your previous paper on QG. My question is more like, like, you have also the training, so it's like 24 months of training that people go there. So you are in a very, like, uh, a community that's very, very low uh, human capital and literature. So do you think that uh, even this size that's quite big uh, in terms of the transfer that you need to give to the people, this could be even bigger, right, without the training? because if you go there and you give like people this financial basic uh, uh, education, this this also like complements the transfer, right? Do, do, do you have like any like idea on, on how this impacts the size that you are calculating on, on the, in terms of the of the transfer? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. The, 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 the kind of reality was it was difficult enough to convince BRAC to do an RCT and they were willing to to separate out the two elements, which is understandable because you actually know is you know you need to learn how to, to run a business. It's not it's not automatic. But what we're doing in Pakistan is we're giving a pure cash transfer, which is the cost not just of the, the transfer of the livestock, but also of the training. And then seeing whether just giving money and then letting them buy whatever assets they want. Uh, is more effective. And the initial results doesn't suggest that the case. A, interestingly, when they get the money, a lot of them buy livestock. <laughs> uh, 
but it does, there, there's some, also some stuff that Dean Carr and others have done in Ghana, which suggests that the training component can be important. But we don't know whether you could sort of cut it back or, um, my, own, my own sense of it is that quite a big part of this is convincing extremely poor people. So these are people, by the way, so when I went first to look at the, these populations in 2006, I drove around in a, in a, in a car with the translator, I, I randomly picked people a different pilot two or four years in. So, and then some control. These are people who are literally, their children are dirty, the, the house is sort of palm leaves. It's very, very poor people. I think part of that weekly visit is maybe sort of partly psychological that you can you can do this, that you're, uh, you're, you're able to do that. And they do other things, which I didn't mention, which is the elites in the village form a committee who also assist these ultra poor if there's problems, say, you know, your cow eats some of the neighboring crops or, because they're so low down in the power distribution that perhaps without that added handholding. Uh, but the truth is we don't know the answer to that, whether just expanding the, the transfer either in productive assets or money would be more effective than combining the, the training with the productive assets. I think you're muted, Mano. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Lucas, do you have another question? No, that, that was more like, uh, I was just curious about that. And I do totally agree that this problem is more multidimensional than just like the aspect of capital. But I totally agree that capital uh, can explain several like different explanations for the poverty trap that you are trying to address here. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Lucas. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, is the effective size of the transfer an absolute number or relative to the level of wealth consumption in the environment? Um, say, is the impact affected by initial inequality? Yeah, so the, 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 the size of the transfer is the same um, for each in, individual. Um, so that's the, the first thing. So it's, it's not a, it's not, calibrated by how, but in terms of the impact on inequality, basically that's the whole point is that if you're starting with fewer productive assets, if you're like zero assets, zero K zero, then that same value of transfer may not get, it's less likely to get you above K. Uh, so that would accentuate inequality because it would mean that some people would uh, come out of poverty. Now on average, of course, welfare is going up but it would basically take a group of people who are all poor or roughly assetless. And that tiny difference in terms of whether you have a shed, whether you have a rickshaw, then becomes accentuated. Because if you jump above K-star, then you continue to accumulate assets such as land and so forth. Whereas if you don't, you fall back into the zero asset uh, situation. And remember, if you fall back into the zero asset situation, the employer of last resort is agricultural laborer made all the stuff that is, um, you know, the, the, the kind of jobs that, that, that the poor do because they can't, they can't find better jobs. Okay, thanks Robin. Uh, there is also a question here. What kind of ethical review took, takes place at the start of this kind of study? Who offers approval? So the ethical review is done um, by an ethics board um, at the LSC, um, BRAC also has an ethical review. And essentially the way we work is um, the, the implementing organization, in this case BRAC, but it could be a government, um, has to want to do something. We're not, we played no role in the design of the, of the program. So it's basically a, a program that that BRAC designed and which to have evaluated. And we, we played that evaluation role. And many of the people on the, uh, on the for example, on the QGE paper were researchers within BRAC, some of whom had come to do PhDs at the LSE. But the, the ethics is, is done at the LSE. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I don't see any other question here. Uh, any other question, folks, um, or comment?
Okay, uh, then uh, let me thank Robin uh, again for, for accepting. Um, without any hesitation, I, that, uh, the invite was, uh, took place a long time ago, back in January. Uh, and also let me think, oh, let, oh, wait, 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 there is a question. Uh, Phil, uh, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to ask a very practical question. If you give someone a cow, do they sell the milk or are they using the milk in the household? Uh, you mentioned selling meat, but if you sell me, then you kill your asset. Um, so I, I would just like to know how they do it, and thanks. Yeah, so it's, uh, I should have sort of mentioned more about the, 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 the assistance of BRAC is not only to get you the cow, but they also have um, uh, an artificial insemination uh, service, because obviously to produce milk, the cow has to be pregnant. And that's organized by BRAC. And, and interesting, there's also a big um, chiller uh, system. So if you go and buy milk in a shop in Dhaka, often it's BRAC milk, <laughs> which is procured from these, these cows. So the dominant source of income is from, from milk. With the male calves, um, they, they, they either are killed for meat or they're used as um, draft animals, which you can either rent out or use. And on your question about the the, the, how we certainly see an improvement, which I think is going back to the anthropometrics of the children in um, uh, milk consumption, but a lot of the improvement in income uh, and surplus that can be used on other assets such as land and so forth. Because what's interesting is a lot of the diversification is away from the asset that was transferred. So the cow was the dominant initial asset. You see things like they buy rickshaws, they rent those out, they buy land. So you see both some improvements in own consumption of milk, but certainly uh, selling of the surplus of the, and obviously you, you have calves because they're pregnant. And, um, but the dominant source of income is, the, uh, is, is milk, which is for sale. Cool. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Uh, any other question or comment folks? Nope. Oh, there is, there is uh, from Jim. Um, Jim, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. I'd just like to ask about the proportions of people involved. So will these transfers be taking people out of poverty? Will they be taking the recipients over a bunch of people who would still be classed as poor? Um, that's... That's the essence of what I wanted to ask. Yeah, I think there is there is for the for the group that um, that gets above the threshold. Some of them will. Be, so, if you remember, we we classified as ultra poor, which are, you know they have the characteristics that make them potential beneficiaries, and then you have the near poor, and you have middle and upper, and there's certainly going to be some crossing of the. Um, jumping, people being jumped over the near poor, particularly those who managed to accumulate land and so forth. But interestingly, in the QJE paper, we did look at uh, wages. And as more people focus on their business, in this case, livestock, um, you actually saw the wages in the agricultural um, uh, labor markets go up, which obviously benefits people who are still in that sector. And by no means did this group completely stopped doing a lot of the wage thing. What happened, and the kind of point of the QJE paper is that the actual total labor supply, which now was a combination of both livestock rearing and uh, laboring, that goes up. So interestingly, in Bangladesh, it does look like the very, very poor were kind of underemployed. I mean, that they, they weren't finding enough demand for their labor, particularly in periods of low agricultural demand. And so when the livestock businesses came on, they could, because it was a more steady demand for labor. You have to spend four or five hours a day doing that. The total number of hours work went up and that was one of the big factors that led them to become better off. Okay, uh, Matthew, uh, go ahead. Thanks Manuel and thanks also Robin for a very fascinating 
very powerful study, I think. You spoke in the beginning about how you've been speaking to policymakers, how the study has found resonance in that community. Um, what, what can you just give us an overview of what those discussions are about, how policymakers are interfacing with these results, what kind of questions they're trying to answer, how they're using the paper? Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, just as a very recent example on Friday, I was talking to the uh, Sanya Nishtar, who's the head of EHAS in Pakistan, which is the big social protection ministry. And I think there, what they're interested in is obviously post COVID. Uh, what's happened a lot in COVID is that the poorer people, particularly entrepreneurs and so on, have been pushed down because if you're rich, you can just close your business, go home, reopen it. But if you're poor, you need income. And so a lot of these businesses are going bust. So her general concern was not just post COVID, but more generally, how are you going to draw up? So basically what happened in Pakistan is that they were reasonably successful in getting transfers because I think they reached about half the population. So there's been a kind of acceptance that the government can do things. And now they're interested in, so how do we get the poorer segments of Pakistan into slightly better jobs? And one thing to do might be to say, take the Benazir Bhutto transfer program, which is the cash transfer program, and add in graduation elements so that you're actually learning how to run different so the, 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 the kind of discussion, whether it's IMF, World Bank, is this what I would call productive welfare. So can you do welfare in a way that you just do it for a short period of time and then you let people grow out of poverty because they, you know, they're now doing more productive jobs. That's the sort of the, it could be just as relevant in, in the UK as in, in, uh, in Pakistan. A lot of, you know, because the way the welfare has tended to function is you provide transfers to people who are, say, unemployed. Uh, and if that doesn't help them to get a better form of employment or get some very similar forms of employment, then that may not really change. So it's almost like getting people to jobs that have some form of profile, sort of some sort of life, life cycle profile, rather than a very flat profile where you, know, you become an agricultural laborer, you make X per hour, and that just continues on until you're. 50, 60 years old, which is what a lot has been happening in these, uh, in, in, in certainly the communities I know in Pakistan and in India. And um, because it's, it's unskilled, it's, it's no reason that you should pay somebody who's older more. Whereas ideally there would be some, there was some, some degree of learning. And the question is, and, and maybe for those, you do need to go younger. You need to go to people who are going into the labor force to, as we did in Uganda. But that's the basic sense of it, that maybe fiscally it's cheaper to provide that big push for a couple of years and then let people rather than have to provide continuous uh, uh, transfer. That, that's the sort of essence of the idea. But how you, know, how you do that in different contexts in terms of getting people with uh, better occupations is, you know, we're, we're, we're figuring that out. But I think there's a general sense um, that just secondary school completion may not provide you with the skills to get into more skilled services and uh, manufacturing type, types of employment. Okay, thanks, Robin. Uh, one last question here, Robin. Uh, was there any concomitant work, for example, looking at social cohesion, the perception of the participants of the program, the perception of people with whom these others newly more productive may compete? Um, we did not do that work, but there has been, I'm trying to remember, um, there has been some, quite a lot of qualitative studies of uh, what happens with participants and, and you know, going back to the uh, one of the previous questions about how the people who didn't get the program felt about it. Um, so certainly that, there's, that kind of work has gone on, but I, I, our team didn't do that, um, didn't do that work, but it's certainly available. Okay, cool. And uh, what about the quality of the asset? Cow. Some give more milk and others meat than others. Some may have a longer productive life than others. And this is really the last question. Um, so the, the cows, as I said, were procured by BRAC in local livestock markets. There certainly will be some heterogeneity in milk production and, and the like. But what 
what they're equalizing is in effect the purchase value. And so, um, and obviously some may have diseases and so forth, but if, if for example, a cow died of a disease that's you know, not for neglect, the, the, the BRAC would play some role in replacing that cow, but only within the 24 month period. After that, they, people were left on their own. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm stop recording now.